It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast, where the newest MLW Tag Team Champions, myself, Dennis Farrell, Lars Fredrickson, we talk to the booker. We're going over on their next pay-per-view, whether they like it or not. Uh, Court Bauer, MLW owner, president, CEO, COO, whatever you want to call him, producer, this guy's on our podcast today. And Court, I want to tell a quick, quick story. Uh, when I walked away from doing fantasy football for ESPN, PD Williams and myself started a podcast and our biggest dream was to get on to the MLW podcasting network. I might've sent you no less than 300 email. Uh, <laughs> that's where you may know my name from just in case, unless you have it like spam blocked, Dennis Farrell goes right into your spam. That's me. Pleasure to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you, Dennis. I think I saw a few of those emails. You better. Thank you. Thank you. I love the replies, by the way. That made me feel. <laughs> yeah, well, Conan was in charge of that. So I'm going to pass the heat on to Conan. Oh, well, I mean, that makes sense then. <laughs> Thanks, Conan. I gave up my seat for him once, and uh, that doesn't go. You know, I, no. we got I ran. I ran into him once at, a, at, at the airport in San Jose when I was going to Japan. And what we did is we we rec I recognized him. I came up to him, and we started talking. And as at the time that uh, I was good friends with Vampiro, and all we did was talk about Vampiro. And I I never we I never like got to ask him the questions I wanted to ask him. You know what I mean? It was it was about somebody completely different. So I'll go figure. <laughs> what, I what, what, what was this like? There are times when they're on good terms. It's very rare where the like the stars align. Was this one of those moments, or was this one of those not so good I, moments? You know what? I don't. I don't know. I mean, I was. You know, it was hard for me to sense it, but I felt like, you know, because Conan obviously has, has been one of those guys that's given a lot back to the business. Rey Mysterio, you know. A lot of these guys owe a lot of their career to Conan. I mean, he he sort of busted open the door for a lot of the the Mexican stars, as far as like you know North Amer American yeah. wrestling TV and whatever. So, oh no, it's none of my business. You know, wrestlers are fucking drama as it is. It's like, and even back then, <laughs> I knew that. So yeah. it's like, you know, but I always was a fan of Conan. Um, you know, I used to watch him all the time. So. That's funny that you mentioned Conan. Um, I I digress. We got you on the show, so I would I would much now like to you know redirect and talk about you. Dennis normally asks the first question, so I'm going to allow him to do that. Thank you, boss. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I, listen, let's start off by talking about the MLW. I remember when you guys kind of broke through that glass ceiling of being a major company, which was very exciting to me because I knew a lot of guys on there. I knew you guys from the podcasting network as well. And to watch where your product has grown from in an industry where it was WWE, then nobody else, then Impact kind of kind of moved up. Uh, and NWA, and you have all these, and now you guys are up there with probably – I'd even say half the budget of an NWA and you're just as popular. What, what math goes into it from your end to say, all right, you know what? We are a, I, and I don't know if I'm offensive with this, but like a mom and pop shop that have kind of blossomed out and we are hanging with the big boys. Is, is, is it something that like you had designed in your plans? Happy accident? How does MLW, I mean, how does MLW go from, you know, a, a little Court Bauer run thing to like a major program in today's day and age? You know, I think back when we first started in 2002, the original, original version, and the first people I brought in was the head of production for ECW, Charlie Brzees, and Joey Styles, who, who Charlie recruited for me. And they sat me down and really taught me about wrestling production because ECW did it on a shoestring budget, and they made, made the most out of nothing and made the negative into a positive, made things atmospheric. Instead of it looked like a dump, it had character. And so just Joey and Charlie in the same basement where they produced and filmed all your favorite ECW episodes 
was our lab where we created the original MLW. Uh, so right then and there, you know, it's the same kind of bootstrap mentality of like, yeah, we're, we were facing a billionaire and, and there was this kind of scorched earth effect in the wake of ECW and WCW's demise of like, there's got to be something else out there other than WWE. And Impact was going to try and go a more glossy, big production. But I was like, there's that other product, that underground, that lo-fi, edgy thing. And, and that's where we tapped into in 2002. And then circle back when we did it in 2017 after a, a bit of a hiatus, we started a nightclub in Orlando. A lot of the same people from the ECW days. Uh, and the MLW days, and then some people from that I knew from WWE that were used to this huge budget. I'm like, guys, it's going to be different. You're going to have to work with smaller crews and be very resourceful and, and be challenged every day on, on whether you're you're putting together a wrestling match or doing a pre-tape. It's it's a totally different experience, and we've grown it into something now that's in 60 countries and growing, and we're on national TV at BN Sports. Uh, and also on BN Espanol, and we've got all this other stuff going. We've got Pro Wrestling TV, our new streaming home. So it's it's just, you know, just trying to be inventive and always be able to be nimble when something challenges you, whether it's now a second billionaire entering the conversation or a pandemic or the economy. You just got to be able to adapt. When you're smaller, I think you can blow up the model and try different things easier than when you're a huge machine. Well, you know, that's the, that. that. You, you kind of answered my question that I had was my first question. Because when I first tuned into MLW, I think I got a few of the DVDs, maybe even the first one off of High Spot, right? <laughs> and that's kind of like how I got, you know, noticed and that because you were bringing in kind of bigger names right. to yeah. the world. And now what the company is, is kind of like something completely different. It's not just relying on these bigger stars. It's, it's almost as if like it's, it's now a fresh new young company. Now, that's the thing. You guys were happening, and then all of a sudden, where did you go, right? Right. So did you know going into this hiatus that there was going to be this, this long sort of period where you weren't going to be doing this? Was this like, or, or was this just, uh, you know, a victim of circumstance? Yeah, I, I felt, it, you know, after I did uh, MLW, I took a break, did some stuff outside of, of wrestling, and then went to WWE for a few years. So it's almost like I got, you know, my MBA uh, paid for by WW went to the Harvard of wrestling to learn right. at the highest levels, work right with Vince at a time when, you know, they were really killing it. And from there, then just kind of went off after WW just totally went away from wrestling, did other stuff, did stuff in MMA, did stuff in TV, just, just tried different things. I was in my late twenties. Like, let me, all right, let me try something else. I'm kind of burned out. Want to learn something else. And really outside WWE, the options in, you know, 2007, 2008 weren't great. And I was burned out. And I also was like, it was right after the Ben Watt thing. I was like, man, my heart's just not into it. I stopped watching wrestling for a few years, which, you know, growing up since a kid, loving it, obsessively watching anything, good, bad, or otherwise. Didn't matter if it was in English. Didn't matter what language it was. I'd watch it. To go into a place where you're, you're in the headspace where you just can't even go there um, was shocking to me. It took a long time to kind of work through that process. And get back into it. It was like the podcast with Conan and, and, and St. Laurent in 2012 that I finally kind of got back into wrestling, reconnected with people in wrestling. And that kind of then brought about all the other stuff. I don't want this to be a them versus them kind of question, but in conspiracy, comparison, when I you know have talked about the growth of MLW, recently Billy Corgan said about the NWA they'd like to see them become a – a minor league for a major wrestling corporation. But then I kind of look at MLW and I go, that's not where they are. A and how does your mindset come into structuring this company now in, in today's age where everybody can kind of do multiple TV shows and contracts and stuff like that, where, you know, you have some of these guys that are like, Hey, we would love to be the minor leagues. And you guys are like, we are our own thing. Uh, I think it's in the name, Dennis. It's in the name. Well, that's where I missed up. Oh, guys. Oh, thank you for coming on the show. Good night, everybody. <laughs> but, but you understand where I'm going with right. this question. Yeah, I, I think everyone has their different kind of business strategy, and I think it evolves. I think, you know, we all go out there with a certain vision for what we want to accomplish. 
And then the whole landscape changes multiple ways, multiple different challenges, good things, bad things. And so you just try to find your path forward and you try to identify an opportunity. Maybe Billy's looking and seeing, hey, there's opportunity for me in this place to present uh, an opportunity with a potential larger company or something and do an affiliation. Um, you know, I like the idea of that, you know, we get to kind of extend these bridges, open, you know, create borderless bridges to Japan, whether it's Dragon Gate or Puerto Rico with IWA or with Mexico and get our talent busy and active all over the place. So we can bring in some of the guys from Dragon Gate or send some of our guys to Puerto Rico or bring some guys in from Mexico. So I kind of look at it from our point of view is like, there's opportunities to develop talent and share talent. I'm just doing it a little differently with the international thing. And I think that our talent benefits from that. We don't have the weird hangups strategically of you're, you know, I don't care personally for kind of being a satellite to something bigger, but everyone has their different, you know, play. Um, you know, I was part of WWE when they had multiple developmental territories and you see how that works or doesn't work. And, you know, looking at WWE, you know, they have an incredible infrastructure now with the PC. So, you know, it, when I was there, you had OVW at Deep South Wrestling and they've had different versions of that since the late nineties when JR set it up. Um, you know, does, does a, a third party property work in 2022, or maybe that maybe something that another company like AEW wants, I, I couldn't answer that, but for us, I think it's a different path. And like, if I'm, you know, shopping our, our, our rights to someone, whether it's in India or in the U S they, they don't want to hear that. They want to hear that you're going to deliver and you're going to give them the best product. And that's, that's my obligation. So like, that's, you know, we're building our, our network of 60 countries and growing, like I'm in it for, I'm, I'm in it to win it. So, you know, you mentioned that you did work for the WWE. You got, had your burnout, you go to work for them. What are the golden nuggets that you took? I mean, get, you know, what, what is, what are those things that you've now learned there, maybe applied to your own company? Well, I think wrestling has like this built in culture. It's, oh, it's, it's generation to generation. It's almost consistent in that, yeah, you know, we kind of have a lackadaisical vibe sometimes. Like, yeah, fuck it, we'll get it right next time. Um, or just like a lack of accountability. You see in a lot of companies, and it really is the undoing of those companies. Whereas when you work for WWE and Vince at the time when he was at the helm, you know, he micromanaged, which was a lot of people towards the end were very negative on. But for a lot of years, that's what really helped him have a leg up on the comp competition. He was not just micromanaging, he was creating a, a culture and I don't, this sounds kind of uh, sinister or, or intense, but it's, he created a ruthlessly efficient machine where you hold people accountable, but you, the expectations you're going to knock out of the park every time. And the bar is high. You don't go in there, phone it in. You look at WCW and at a certain point, you know, there was no expectation to deliver. You just sit home. And, and so like for us and what I bring to MLW is a little bit of that in my own way, different than how Vince did it. But, you know, you would not, you see what were some of the intangibles, those X factors that made him have the competitive advantage. Yeah. He inherited a great market from his dad. Yes. He had this infrastructure and he's, he got this distribution model, but when challenged and when he was fighting from underneath, what made the machine roar again was that ruthless efficiency. All right, court, if I can call you that, uh, you're, you're working under Vince. How many, this is kind of a two part, one part question. How many times have you sat there going, you know what, if I had my own company, I would not do things this way. And then you have MLW go, all right, I see what he's doing now. Was, was there ever that moment where you kind of, when you're there, you're under his thumb and you're like, F this guy, I would, this is the stupidest thing ever. And now you're in the same shoes going, all right, uh, Uncle Vince, I get it now. I think so. And, and I think there's this moment too, when you, when you're done it the bootstrap way and the, 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 the DIY way. And then you see like, there are times when Vince will try something and spend a significant amount of money and it doesn't work. And he just says, all right, well, we tried it. And you're like, wow, that could have, that could have, you know, funded a half a year for my company, you know, back in the day. One time we had a thing where the boogeyman who loved to eat worms, not really, but it was part of the gimmick. Uh, and we had the uh, these worms fall from the ceiling oh, uh, of the arena. 
and JBL's rolling around in them because, of course, the heel's oh. terrified of the worms. And Vince is laughing. Oh, that's great. And it's, it's raining worms in the arena. And he turns to us and goes, how much were those worms? There's a lot of worms. And we get the production assistant. We said, uh, the writer's assistant said, how much, did, how much was that? He goes, well, sir, uh, that was $30,000. And Vince just his jaw drops. It was $30,000 for worms. Oh, they were out of normal worms. So we had to go organic. And he, he just looks shocked. He's like, I can't believe we just blew $30,000. And there's John Layfield rolling in the worms and he's crying and it's everyone's laughing. But it's like, he was shocked. And I think that that creative system, I think, was fired soon thereafter. But the show went on. You think about a lot of companies, you know, just throw for a gag to spend that kind of money. It's excessive. At WWE, it's on a totally different level. But, you know, you've had, like, you know, we before mentioned, you know, you've had some of the old time stars in your company, and then you have the the young guys. At uh, being, you know, the head of a company, do you approach the talent differently? Like, let's say with a veteran as opposed to a new guy, or do you have sort of a, a universal way that you try to communicate what you're trying to get at? Oh no, I, I try to understand their process and incorporate it into my process. You know, I think the system works best when you kind of can decode the talent and, and, and tap into what motivates them and get the best out of them. And if you just dictate, this is what we're going to do tonight. And, you know, it's maybe like the Bill Watts way. It, it's this generation is just not going to respond to that. There are different generations respond to different things. I think, you know, even the sports, different coaches will have a different connection with players. My thing is just trying to understand what drives them, what motivates them. And then, you know, incorporate it into how I can best use them. I, I think, you know, one of the things that we've been able to do is kind of our version of Moneyball, where we identify undervalued or undiscovered talent, put them in our system and make it rock. And, and we've done a good job of that over the last five years. Anytime we've had bookers or writers or anybody creative on, I always love to ask this question of growing up, you've already mentioned you love wrestling and you've been in the industry who are some of the guys that have their fingerprints on your ideals going into when you create a, a storyline or the show or just kind of in general, a storyline? Uh, I mean, a lot of this collaborative process, I'll give them kind of a, a big picture of where we're going and they'll, they'll have, Hey, I have this crazy idea. We'll try to find a way to incorporate it. If it makes sense, it's, you know, I don't want them to ever feel like when they get a promo, they're not getting, this long thing that they have to memorize. Like, this is the essence of what I want. Here's a little outline. Make it you. Make you know, own it. Don't make. Don't put words in your mouth that are not you. You know, a 44 year old dude. You're a 22 year old dude. Make this you. Make this authentic. Uh, so it's a very collaborative thing. I try to let them know the whole vision for the match as soon as possible, so they can start visualizing and making it the best match possible. Um, you know, early on, I didn't understand any of this, and I remember sitting after a show in Fort Lauderdale and it was the main, main event was Dusty Rhodes versus Terry Funk versus um, we were just talking uh, about this before you got on. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it was uh, Dusty Carino and Funk and it didn't have, it wasn't a good house. It was a bad house. And I was like, man, I had, had Dusty in Fort Lauderdale, you know, blood and guts. What, what happened here? And I remember just before the show started, D uh, Dusty's got the granny glasses and he's peeking through, the curtains and he goes this is not gonna be a good house tonight and i said uh yeah thanks um and uh after the show hey kid come back to uh come back to the hotel and so and, and we'll just have a conversation and so i went up and went into funk and, and dusty were in a hotel room together and it was a double double tree and they had they had beer and dusty was dunking those double tree cookies in the beer and they were watching a playoff game basketball no it was a regular season basketball game and they, we, so they sat there and told me, listen, man, it's been a good night, you know, but part of learning the business uh, is identifying the mistakes and, you know, finding the right ingredients because we, everyone's going to, every booker is going to cook a, a bad cake, but it's learning how to make a good one. And you only go through that process by failure and then, you know, acknowledging the failure, knowing it, and then being able to build upon it so you don't make that same mistake again. And I think, you know, that's the one of the weird, unfortunate things about wrestling today is that really there's not a lot of people that are sharing the knowledge of a booker. It's like, it's this, it's a very important part of the craft, but there's not bookers sharing that knowledge. I was lucky. I had Terry, Dusty, Gary Hart. 
those kind of people are not around really anymore yeah. to share that knowledge. I was lucky and I was in the business when that happened for five, six years. I was, was the first five, six years, I was clueless. Uh, and you just got to find the right minds and guys like Pat Patterson, not around anymore. So when you have these people and you have access to them now, man, it's precious. We got to seek out that knowledge and it's hard to find it. A lot of people say, Hey, I'm going to do a booking seminar. They don't know anything about booking. It's just a con. Well, where you did make up on the back end of that one show with Dusty and Terry Funk was yours truly bought the DVD and saw the egg sucking dog promo with your Terry <laughs> Funk. So, you know, you had me. I just was in California, you know, it was yeah, a long yeah, time, know. you know. So, you know, that's one of those things that I think about as so some companies make that mistake of, of, you know, when they're trying to be fresh and new, they're going to bring in a lot of these older stars whose maybe their prices are a little bit higher than a younger star, but you want that name value, right? So, but there has to be a happy medium. Mm -hmm. And it was, so what have you learned over this time with the WWE into where you are now? Do you feel like that creative process, and I, maybe this has nothing to do with, with what I originally started with, but I started thinking about the creative process and with the wrestlers, how you basically say, well, I'll just kind of give them an outline, then they go do what they do. Do you think that there's more creative freedom in a, in a, in a company like yours than there is in some other companies? Yeah, I think you have to have structure. You can't just you just can't a la carte give everyone just that that blank canvas because you're gonna have chaos. You're gonna have creative chaos, uh, and you're gonna have egos. And then all of a sudden, no one's gonna do a job. And believe me, it happens. Um, I, I've always since day one believed in long term booking. Whether it's 2002 or 2003, we're doing you know a young CM Punk, and he was you know rubbing up against Vampiro. So you know people didn't know who Punk was really then. So when he worked Vampiro, who was fresh off of WCW, had that great career in, in CMLL, to then have that awareness of, okay, this is a star, and this is a cool guy we don't know much about, but hey, he's hanging there with Vamp, that's interesting. And so to be able to balance those guys and have a good balance of established stars and legends, and then the new era guys, that's always been a, a key hallmark of my booking. And I think I prefer that kind of booking where you have a little bit, I think fans like to see what's coming next. They like the vignettes. That's an interesting character. I want to see what he's going to do when he's in there with the established characters. That's interesting to me. Um, but I think in terms of the creative process, it's, it's an evolving thing. What worked in 2002 isn't going to work in 22. What's going to work next year may not work the year after. So it's like, you've got to keep learning. You got to keep watching all the different competitors out there around the world to see what's working, what's not working. And what's something that isn't, being tapped into that maybe you can tap into and that's not necessarily coming from wrestling there's the danger of being in the wrestling bubble and then you ignore what's going on culturally outside of it the best version of wrestling is when you're riding that crest of culture and tap into it and it blends with wrestling that's oh i mean the rock and roll express or the rock and roll express and the rock and wrestling connection of the 80s those things were huge because it just kind of brought a convergence of pop culture and wrestling in the late 90s, you know, Mike Tyson, DX, uh, Steve Austin, boom, it happens again. It happened with WCW with, with, with all the guys they brought in. So it's just trying to find the right balance of that. When you're a smaller company, you have to find different ways to do it. We do a lot with the music. We, you know, we're lucky to have, we, we kind of lean more into the hip hop stuff, but we like to work with different artists and stuff and, and use the music as much as possible, whether it's sort of walkout for an entrance theme song or the fusion theme song itself. It, well, I've been looking for a job. An artist. Yeah, I mean, I've been looking for a new job. So if you ever need music, <laughs> let me know. Oh, for sure. Let's talk. <laughs> I need it. Well, okay. I definitely want to know. We have we've had a lot of younger guys and older guys on, and some guys are pro politicking, some guys are against politicking. But as a as a guy who has power, do 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 you? look down on a guy that may come in and say, Hey, listen, you should think of me in this position. Or do you, you know, like a guy that just sits in the back of a room, waits to be noticed. And then you go to him because I don't know if there's any easy way to get yourself noticed or politic without everybody going, Oh, there he is the Brown noser. It's all about how you do it in the circumstances and the situation where you find yourself needing that person. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, the loudest guy in the room is the guy that's going to put you off the most. Um, it just depends on the situation. There's some of the biggest stars going to be the most obnoxious, biggest politickers. Some of the best guys are the quietest. Guys. It just depends. 
it just depends on the moment, the person, the situation, and, and what's the what's the what's the culture like backstage. You know, um, we don't really have a political thing um, easy to find at a show. So it's not like you have to go through middlemen or the yes men. There's not like it just come to me, find me, uh, buck stops with me. Do you feel like that's something that you learn in the WWE? Is because you see like in a lot of the bigger companies, either they don't have the structure. So there's drama or there's maybe too much structure and too many, too, too much red tape, you know. Yeah. So where do you find that balance? Well, I think you also got to be careful, too, because you don't want to just micromanage and do it all, because then you're not delegating. Then you're going to burn out. Then things are going to get messed up. I always say, look, you know, I like to micromanage, but multitasking means fucking up multiple things simultaneously. <laughs> so you got to find the balance. <laughs> you know, it's everything's about balance. <laughs> all right. I, I have to ask a fanboy question. I know we're nearing the end of this podcast here soon. And uh, as a guy, as we talked earlier, I was a massive fan of the MLW Podcast Network. And I know this is like, hey, let's talk about that one thing you did 20 years ago. But it was so successful. It birthed so many podcasts and it brought so many people that are now personalities in the wrestling industry to the forefront of it. Have you ever thought about maybe, listen, with this popular now as podcasts are, and you were kind of one of the forefathers of wrestling podcast and podcast networks, maybe like bringing it up under a different name or bringing it back because it was so popular? Yeah, it, we've, we've, we've actually been talking with Conrad Thompson about that. You know, it, it's definitely possible. It's partial, part of it's like just schedule, you know, just wh when's that window every week? Because once you start it, you want to be able to deliver every week to the fans. You don't want to say, oh, man, we're just a week or two behind. Don't worry. You want to be able to deliver every week. I would love it, I think, just to have that kind of candid access without the bullshit. It's like, hey, that was a great week. And then the next week, well, yeah, we learned a few things that week. I, I would love to do something that candid. Um, will it happen? I guess we'll just wait and see. But it's certainly something that we've been, we've been talking about this year. Also at the top of the show, should Lars and I just email you then if we want to show on this network? Because <laughs> I know we're getting you don't like Pete Williams. No, no, listen, look, look, at, look at, we're getting jobs left, right, and center over here, Dennis. I mean, thanks, Cork. Really appreciate you coming on and giving us jobs. <laughs> you got it anytime. Now I know I was booked. <laughs> that, this is politicking 101, everybody out there. Yeah, yeah everybody watch. Yeah, you well, bring you, know you I, bring the the guy on the podcast, and then when you get him on tape, you go, "Hey, can we have all these jobs?" <laughs> well, I want to know about the writing, okay? Because it's like I sometimes sit there, and I'm and, and I, I I am not no you know armchair booker. I hate that shit, but I do sometimes watch a storyline unfold or certain things happen in wrestling and wonder how the fuck did that guy get that job. Because that was the shittiest fucking thing I've ever seen, or whatever, or vice versa. So, yeah. like when you're when you're looking for writers or you're looking for people, maybe this, you know, some of our fan base out there, you know, wants to know a lot of this stuff. But it's like, let's just say I'm 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 a writer, okay, and I know a, a lot about professional wrestling, or maybe I even don't. What are the qualifications for me to get that gig? Look, at I'm looking for another fucking job. Can you believe it? <laughs> it, it? It's like you know, I only right now I think there's like two creative teams of the major companies i think it's wwe and i think impact AEW doesn't have one tony's the booker um i'm the booker uh there's no creative team with me so it's like you know you, i guess look you have it, it's like 50 50 right so there's there's definitely you have and i think look wwe is so massive in, in, in scale it's like they have you know seven hours of tv i think probably just off their three top things and then there's the right, second right. tier and so it's like you know you need like a director of continuity and all these things like rob b's doing for them you need that for something so large smaller companies or with less tv hours you're not going to need that kind of staff you know i, I always wondered like you know, how does a booking committee differ from a creative team uh i was a part of a creative team at wwe and saw what that worked like it was very political very bureaucratic and from talking with guys like uh, dusty who was a part of one jim Cornette, gary hart when they were part of the old nwa and wcw booking team with turner you know it's like it's funny in that like i guess the writers have come from a different background different experience the wrestling people in the the booking committees had a distinct very specific skill set that they applied to that committee but in the end 
the same challenges were truly, it came down to who was the decision maker and they're giving the thumbs up, thumbs down, and they're directing and defining the shape of the creative. And they kind of are essentially the ones that are driving it. You have suggestors, whether they come from Hollywood or they come from the territories or, or a WCW or ECW or wherever, they have, a, they have a different suggestion maybe, but at the end, the end result is what that, that, that Vince McMahon or that guy, at, Eric Bischoff at WCW is looking for. And, it, and, and ultimately it's, it's, how you, it's who you go with on those things and who has the, the better instincts and the better talent and all those things converging. Depending on how much time Lars has left, this might be my last question. I'm not sure. But uh, as a guy who has limited time, your husband or wife, I don't know, uh, kid, father, you, you run this corporation. You probably have many different pies in the oven elsewhere. Uh, talent. When it comes to finding talent, are you, MLW is at the point now where I'm sure talent can come to you and you don't really have to work hard at finding it. But how do you, if you have to start looking for talent, how do you go about looking for talent? Oh, I mean, yeah, it's a it's a constant thing. And I, I think the craziest thing is a lot of time I'm just scrolling on social media and I'm seeing a, a, a clip, a, a, you know, a GIF or a GIF and to say, oh, that's interesting. Let me look, look deeper into this guy. Uh, and that's honestly how I found a lot of guys, whether it was like an Alex Kane or something. Uh, I remember seeing a tweet from like 2019 uh, from someone that just saw Tom Billington versus Mark Billington in the UK, the nephews of the Dynamite Kid. And they're like, dude, you're gonna, you really should sign these guys. At the time, they're like 16 and 17. I was like, yeah, you know, they're 16 and 17. They're, they're, they're young guys. But I started tracking them that day, and I tracked them for the next three years. And we just signed them. And I'm like, it's because of that guy that tweeted me. I started to to track these guys. So it was just a fan that basically got these guys signed three years later when they're now 19 and 21 or whatever, or 20 and 21. And I say, it's, it's kind of totally different than it was in 2002 when people just sent a VHS tape where you had your like cool indie guys you wanted to book. And then the, the established guys had TV time and working out your formula for the booking on that. Uh, so it is different. It is different. And, uh, you know, just trying to balance that time. You know, it, it's when you know, I, I have kids, I have a wife. And, and so you try to find time to run a company and do that. When are you going to have time to look for the next town? You know, maybe I'm waiting for my kids to get out of, you know, an after school thing and I'm just sitting in the car and I'm scrolling, looking at talent or something and sending it to a team like, hey, what do you guys think? You just got to find, you know, max your time. You got to max your time. And, and I think, you know, they used to say like, you know, a, a, a busy active promoter probably isn't sleeping a lot. Definitely guilty of that. You know, I was thinking with what we have today in the world, we have NWA, we have AEW, we have WWE, we have MLW, we have XPW that's come back. You got so GCW? many promotions. Was that? GCW? GCW, I'm sorry to forget. There's so many great promotions that are so accessible. It's a, a fully different world as a pro wrestling fan. Like for me, I was a tape trader, right? So when I wanted to see something, I had to get on the boards, talk to, you know, Phil Schneider or you know whoever it was and say how do i get this and then you would get a list from some dude and then you'd pick through the matches and so on and so forth so it's a whole different world now where does mlw fit in that i mean do you feel like you have direct competition by any of these promotions or do you feel like um and and if so so it's a two-part question do you feel like there's any direct competition with any of these promotions and if so what's one what's the one that grinds your gears the most <laughs> <laughs> probably the one i'm suing right now is the one that grinds my gears the most i guess that's an easy answer layup um you know and, and i think there's been times when i've had a, a philosophy because like early on in my career i got a real cool opportunity to work as i bullshit my way into getting gary albright and doc death to get me uh, a gig working for all japan pro wrestling i was like 18 19 and was the uh, american liaison for all Japan, basically scouting American talent for them. And all I was doing was what you were doing, watching videotapes, tape trading, and suggesting, hey, maybe you should book this guy. And I see Mike Modest or whoever it was, hey, what about it? Um, so yeah, you know, that was that was an interesting moment. Uh, and, and looking at that and, you know, thinking about how all Japan 
was very much an isolated company. They just didn't do business with other Japanese companies in the 90s. They didn't do business with America, really. They didn't do business with anyone. And so I had a little bit of that for a while in this run of MLW. I'm just like, I was isolated. I like just to focus on my thing. Everyone else does their thing. I just, it can get so complicated, so political. And, and then you have, you're kind of like opening the gates to tortious interference. Okay, yeah, we'll send a guy there. You send a guy here, but then they're like, basically like you're recruiting your talent. If you have really good talent, you're going to covet them. So it's like, it took me a while to kind of like work through that and, and kind of see, okay, where are some opportunities for us to work? And a lot of it is, truthfully still international but like look we had davy richards go defend the title in the nwa and it was a really positive experience so cool you know are there other places other opportunities where we would do that it's case by case basis we sent someone to impact wrestling and that was davy richards they gave us sammy callahan for the bell right win-win so it's like it's a case by case process and you kind of see how it works and then assess do you guys want to reload and do it again does it give creative that 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 justifies it both ways and so we're always, you know, we're open for those conversations and it's like, you just kind of play it out, but I'm a little, I guess, more relaxed than I was with the crazy shit back in the day where well, I was let, not very isolated. Well, let me ask you one final question before, you know, Dennis asks his, because I've seen Davey Richards, I got my local indie since I'm in San Francisco mm -hmm. is uh, West Coast Pro. And I've seen Davey Richards come in with the belt and wrestle there. How important are these indies to what you're doing how important is letting your guys go out and spread that message you know because that seems to be like something that is valuable now as mm -hmm. opposed to just you know hoarding for yourself we're the only company that basically says go get those dates we you are unrestricted to go out there and build out your schedule and you're not running for mlw go book your schedule use our tv time use our tv time to get yourself maximum bookings uh, usually if you've got TV time, promoters want you more. If you've got buzz, they want you more because they can sell tickets. So we're like, yeah, go get that. We, we don't want to be involved in the booking. We don't want to create a hurdle. Just go get those bookings. Just make sure they don't conflict with our date and stay, you know, just stay safe and have a good time. You know, I think it's an important part of the ecosystem uh, to do that. So we want our town out there. We want Jacob Fatu working all from coast to coast. Same with Fat, uh, Hammer and all the guys. So, yeah, we're all about it. And I, I love Jacob Fatu. Sorry, I see him on at West Coast Pro all the time. So it's like a lot of your yeah. guys in your company. That's why it's like, and also maybe kind of take a look. Oh, what the fuck's MLW doing? Do you get, you know? So it's working, bro, boss. Go ahead, Dennis. Thank you. Uh, where's the MLW going? We've talked a lot about the past and creative. And you're probably not going to come on here and break any major deals or any major news. We, we get it, unless you want to. And we're all ears, by the way. <laughs> but Lars can leave his kid at school right now if you're going to break anything major. Just, just a <laughs> warning. <laughs> I'm just going to have to. I'm going to have to deal with it when he gets home. So yeah. we'll just get your number and call you up. We'll do a little FaceTime for it. Go ahead. <laughs> I got to. I have to get my son from school too. So we're both on the same schedule. We can't get him right. to go home. Uh, no, no. I mean, you know, you're if you're not growing, you're dying, and it's an important thing because it, 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 it you can't just stay stagnant. You can't just stay with the status quo and say, okay, we're just going to build this. We, you know, we're in the black. Great. You got to take risks. You got to keep, you know, setting meetings, whether you're going to have success or not, whether it's a toy deal. We just announced our toy deal or trying to build out your, your streaming strategy or your linear cable strategy. We're, we're really happy with Pro Wrestling TV, our new streaming partner. And now it's just kind of just driving those eyeballs to the MLW. That's that's what I'm about. Anything I can do that's going to drive those eyes to MLW. So, you know, we're 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 a larger company as a result of it and growing that audience we're about that so you know i don't I, I i hate to tease like oh we got this cool deal coming i like just to drop it and see what happens i'm not going to tease and say it's coming it's six weeks away six months away if a deal happens it happens uh and if not you know you just roll with the punches but you have to be quick to adapt and and that's all we're about and we're looking just to have a bigger 23 uh and now with those crazy things like the pandemic behind us it's just now building on our momentum so no news? Is that what you just told me? There, you spent a lot of time just to say, I'm not saying anything. I just, look, as a promoter, I can say things without saying things. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> That's all he's saying. We're going to see Hulk Hogan back. Okay? <laughs> with beefcake. Yeah. yeah, with beefcake. Uh, you know? 
Court, uh, we're wrapping this up. We'll say our goodbyes off to you. But A, where can people find you personally? Where can people find your product? Because we're definitely want to drive eyes to there. Sure. Well, I'm off social media, so you can get MLW on Twitter at MLW on Instagram, Major League Wrestling, uh, and on Facebook at Major League Wrestling for those still on Facebook. Uh, but you can stream us every Thursday night, 8 p.m. on Pro Wrestling TV. It's available on Roku. It's available on Plex, Samsung, Vizio, PlayStation. If you have a streaming device or platform, you can tap in P- uh, PWTV, Pro Wrestling TV, and you'll get MLW, and it's free. You get our whole library. It's up there for free. We're going to be adding – some really interesting stuff go way back soon. So we'll get some deep cuts soon out there. And uh, we're on BN Sports on cable every Saturday night, coast to coast, nationwide, and on satellite, and on a BN Espanol. And in the UK, we're on Sky TV and around the world, hundred or 60 countries, soon to be 100 countries. But uh, give us a check, MLW Fusion, every Thursday night. You won't regret it. And Lars, real quick before you go pick up your kid, uh, what are you selling this week on Whatnot? My ass. Well, there you go, guys. You want to own a piece of Lars's ass? Make sure you go watch it and subscribe. Court, thank you so much. You, know, for you think you, you think you can just be a smart ass, Court? You know, and then you realize, I'm. Um, you know what? Who? I'm. You know what? When is this show airing? Friday? Yeah. So by Thursday then, night, Friday by morning. Then, but that by then, my show will have come and gone, Dennis. Okay. Do you know what you're selling the week later? I don't know. I don't know either. I gotta, I gotta go through the garage. I'm, you know, what I'm gonna sell. I'm gonna sell my fucking MLW fucking DVDs that I still have from 20 years ago. If you want it autographed, well, I, now, I know a guy that can get it done. Well, well, here's the thing. Now you can stream all this, obviously. So the egg sucking dog promo, I can catch that, and then the the Carino Rhodes Terry Funk, which I thought was a pretty good match, honestly, back then. So whatever. It, I was, well, yeah. I, I remember we were like, Dusty's like, we need some plunder. And we we're like, sent a guy to get plunder in Fort Lauderdale, for like the true value or something. He comes with a freaking snow shovel. And Dusty's like, you want me to hit someone with that sh- the snow shovel? Let me hit you with that snow shovel. And he's like, well, first of all, where are you getting a snow shovel in freaking South Florida in December? What the hell is that about? That's a true wrestling moment. We're like, of course, they're going to get a snow shovel. And of course, they're going to yeah. find it in Fort Lauderdale in December. But, uh, you know, I, I, anytime you can sell some plunder, as Dust used to call it, hey, go get that merch money. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you so much for carving a few minutes out of your time to talk to us. I, We don't say this a lot, but we really hope to have you back on. Now that you're answering my emails, uh, that that shows how far we've come up in the, in the business yes. of podcasting. Yes. When yes. Court replies... It means you're doing something right because literally a thousand emails in your inbox. Ah, oh, come on. Oh, <laughs> don't oh. bust the ball. I, I th- I'm looking here. I, it looks like they were in the spam folder. Yeah, that's exactly uh, next to the bigger penis don't emails. Bu- listen, listen, listen. Don't bust his balls. We've got like three jobs on the line. Right oh, now. well, you've got two. <laughs> I'm being able to be the curtain jerker, so I'm excited about that. So a court, we'll say our goodbyes here off the air. Everybody at home, Wrestling Perspective Podcast. Make sure you rate, subscribe, do all that other dumb podcast crap. We don't care. Just watch us. Thank you, Court, so much for hanging out with us. Good to be with you guys.